In this lecture, I will explain the seven basic design principles so that you can understand which conservation designers of new buildings are facing when creating buildings that are earthquake resistant. There are many ways that horizontal and vertical systems can be used in buildings. The following principles, when applied well, will offer good seismic performance of buildings. These seismic design principles apply to the lateral load system of new buildings. First, use ductile materials and then connect all the building elements. Third, minimize the mass in the mass strength ratio. And fourth, minimize eccentricities and plan irregularities. The fifth principle is to minimize discontinuities and vertical irregularities and then ensure that energy absorption by designing ductile failure mechanisms. Finally, design multiple lateral load paths. Now, let's go through all of these principles some more. The size of the earthquake motion can be predicted with great difficulty and the forces of a real earthquake can be much larger than the design earthquake. The use of ductile materials is needed so that the building can behave in a non-linear way and can absorb energy. This will lead to an economic design, because smaller structural members are needed in comparison to brittle materials, where there are energy absorption is limited. Brittle materials and brittle failure should be avoided by ensuring ductile detailing of building components. Most ductile behavior is to be expected from steel and we see the least ductile behavior in unreinforced masonry. The second principle is to make sure that all the elements of the building are positively connected, so that the building will act as one system. Connections that rely only on friction or have a limited capacity should be avoided. Normally, connections are designed so that they are stronger than the connecting members, so damage or failure will not occur in the connections. For the third principle, we take into account that the forces in the building are proportional to the mass of the building and the building elements. Mass should be minimized where possible in order to reduce these forces. Usually heavy materials are used for sound isolation or fire resistance, but now other approaches should be developed, such as sound isolation by separation and lightweight fire resistant wall and cladding. Moreover, materials with a high strength to mass ratio such as steel and timber are preferred, instead of concrete and masonry. Now to the fourth principle, minimizing eccentricities. We know that the center of mass is a single point where the mass and therefore the seismic forces is concentrated. The center of mass is dependent on the mass distribution and it depends on the floor shapes and the location and the shape and sizes of voids. The center of resistance is a single point where the resistance against seismic forces is seen to be concentrated. The center of resistance depends on the stiffness and distribution of the supporting vertical elements. When the center of mass and the center of resistance are not aligned and show an eccentricity, the floor and the building will come into a torsional mode of shaking. The damage of this torsional mode depends on the size of the eccentricity and is larger than other vibration modes. Therefore, it should be avoided as much as possible. This can be done by aligning the center of mass and resistance for both directions. In order to do this, the floor shape should be symmetrical in both directions, together with balanced and symmetrical support systems in two directions. In addition, the building should always be able to reassist some torsion, since total alignment of the two centers is impossible. This is done by placing vertical systems in such a way that the resultant of the forces do not go through one point, for instance by placing them at the perimeter of the building. In the slides we can see L, H, T shaped buildings. As you can see, these have irregular plan geometri geometries. So these buildings have an eccentricity due to their geometry and the re-entrant corners resulting in torsion. Consequently, Irregular building shapes and re-entrant corners should be avoided as much as possible. Next, it is important to minimize discontinuities, because discontinuities in mass or stiffness will result in localized damage and failure. 
There are different types of discontinuities of the vertical system, and we will look at three of them. First, vertical members should be continuous from the top to the foundation of the building. This is extremely important for shear walls. Transfer beams or transfer floors are minimized as much as possible and are even forbidden in some design codes. However, they are used in some cases where due to the functional nature of the ground floor of a building, openness is preferred. Secondly, large discontinuities in stiffness along the height of the building or different story heights should be avoided as much as possible. Third, discontinuities in mass and stiffness caused by irregular vertical building shapes over the height of the building should be avoided as much as possible. The most extreme form is a podium building in which one building part is significantly taller than the other. Damage can be avoided by separation of the taller and lower building parts. The next principle is about seismic energy absorption by hysteresis damping of the ductile structural element. This seismic energy has to be absorbed in such a way that the locations of absorptions can be predicted. It is important to predict the possible failure mechanisms of the building in order to design failure mechanisms that will not affect the vertical load bearing capacity. For this reason, buildings are designed with plastic hinges at specific locations where the building will have energy absorption. Portal frames are designed with strong columns and weak beams, so that the building can absorb energy in the beams and the vertical load carrying function the columns will remain intact. For braced frames, plastic fuses can be introduced in the braces. While for eccentric braced frames, plastic fuses can be introduced between the braces in a member called the link beam. Plastic hinges and plastic fuses can be detailed by making the structure less strong in specific places. The last principle is about designing multiple lateral load pads. As the nature of the seismic motion cannot be predicted with certainty, building elements will be damaged and they do not fail in a predicted way. In this case, these elements will not be able to transfer the same loads anymore. The loads need alternative parts to go to the foundation. Therefore, in the design, multiple load paths are designed, so that failure of an element will not result in collapse of the total building. We call this redundant design. In this lecture, I have explained seven basic design principles that will help you to understand the consideration that designers of new buildings have to make when designing earthquake-resistant buildings. Thank you.